episode 132 of Off Script with Frisch Close, intimate interviews with interesting people. Joining me today via Skype, I have Kirsten Shockey. Um, she's all about vinegar. In fact, she's the author of Home Brewed Vinegar. You have another book too, right? Big Book of Cider Making. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I actually have um, I brought them in case you wanted to look at anything. But I beautiful. I have this is my so look at you. <laughs> you you've been. You've been busy. Um, you're also, um, you created Ferment Works, fermentation school. And I love, I looked that up online and I love the, uh, there's a line on your on your website that says, uh, micro, microbes plus time equals yum. Yep. <laughs> I, I love that. We're gonna talk all about that um, and how you really got into this and discovered this love of vinegar because you've said it's not all what we think it is, right? It's not all just brown, sour liquid or a clear white liquid that you put in when you're dying Easter eggs. Exactly, yeah, it's it's much more um, nuanced and complex. The other fascinating thing is it's one of probably the world's first ferments because I'm, I guess, not the world's first ferments, but humankind's, um, earliest ferments because it just vinegar happens it happens in nature all the time where there's sugar there's yeast where there's yeast there's alcohol even at, in the smallest flower you can have alcohol being developed in that nectar from the wild yeasts and where there's alcohol there's acetic bacteria and you have vinegar okay and so it's just a no progression i love it it's so nerdy. I love it. This is great. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, Kirsten, where are you from originally? Um, so I was born in Seattle, um, but my parents uh, moved a lot. Um, my dad's an anthropologist. Um, and so I've lived in Germany, Indonesia, New York State, Arizona, Holland. Um, but the last 22 years, I've been here in the Applegate Valley. Awesome. In Southern Oregon. Yes, beautiful Southern Oregon. I interview lots of people all over the place and I always tell them, Southern Oregon is a gem. If you've never been here, you gotta come visit because it's a fantastic place to live. So dad was an anthropologist. So that means, correct me if I'm wrong, but wherever there was work, that's where he was. Yeah, um, so when I was little, he was still in college writing his dissertation. Um, so we were uh, in Ithaca, New York, where he was going to school, and so we were there. And then, yeah, he did his dissertation on a tiny island. It was the early 70s in Indonesia. Um, I was the only white, blonde, curly-headed child they'd see. And so I was, uh, my cheeks were pinched and the whole, you know, <laughs> the whole thing. And then, yeah, and then he got work in Holland, and, and that's why we were there, so. yeah. yeah. What was that like, jumping all over the place as such a youngster, just because of dad's work? Um, yeah, I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't love it. I, um, I, I think I didn't appreciate it until I was much older, all the cool places we'd lived and the experiences that we'd had. Uh, you know, I just wanted to be in one school and have my same friends instead of always being the new new kid in class, you know? For sure, yeah. No, I've been there. I went to three different high schools, I think, in four years. Um, and yeah, you just wanna stay in one spot. You just want this, you wanna go to the same school with the same group of friends and kind of graduate and go on to the, to the next level. So I get that for sure. Yeah, and then later in your life, you're like, oh, actually that was pretty cool that I had a different experience. <laughs> yeah, I also think it, it makes you think on your feet. Um, I because I was in all these different schools, I had to make friends fast in any way that I knew how. And so I, I do think that helps you broaden your horizons a little bit and it, it beefs you up as far as your character goes. But yeah, it's tough on a little kid when you're moving and jumping all over the place. Uh, I think that's part of why um, you know, I was really looking for you know, a little homestead and I really dug in my heels when, when we moved here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then you find you don't wanna go anywhere. I'm just curious as far as dad's work, what kind of anthropology work was he doing? Um, he's a cultural anthropologist. Um, so he was working on, um, actually, on the island of 
Ambon, which was one of the, um, is considered one of the Spice Islands. They'd been colonized by the Portuguese and then the Dutch in order to control the nutmeg and clove trade. So even early on, even though he wasn't dealing with spices, I was in a place where, uh, you know, there's rich, fascinating culinary history. And, and a few years ago, I was able to go back as an adult, which was, which was pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Um, so what comes after high school for you? Like, what, I mean, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, you know, I had a lot of trouble figuring that out. I wasn't, um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I knew that um, I liked, you know, as much as I didn't want to move, I knew that traveling and moving was sort of normal for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I wanted to you know, go into hotel restaurant management. And then I met this cute tall boy and... <laughs> decided, you know, that was cool too. <laughs> so it's always, that's up. all, it's always some, some cute tall boy or some cute tall girl, right? It just, you know, whatever uh, fits your fancy is it's like, oh, they're cute. I'm gonna yeah. go that way. Especially because I wasn't that committed to any of my plans. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Four kids and homeschooling, you know, out here. Um, and, and it was a very food-centered homeschooling. Um, we had the goats, you know, the chickens, the cows, did home dairying. So my fermentation um, sort of passion and all of that mm -hmm. happened in, um, during those years because we were just creating all this food and we needed to preserve it. <laughs> well, and what I found too, it's so important to teach young children about where our food comes from whether you're a vegetarian or a vegan or a meatitarian, it's important to know how, uh, how and, and where it comes from. I mean, it's just so incredibly important and that it, it shouldn't maybe come from a box, right? I mean, it's, it's really important to get those learning lessons. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was a huge thing, you know, for me was that the kids like understood where, where it came from and, that it's not easy, you know, and you're not always going to have everything laid out in front of you in the meat counter or the, or the vegetable counter or wherever you're going, you know, it's, it's, it, just respect that. Right. So, okay. All right. Let's talk about vinegar because I'm dying to get into this. An ancient condiment, you say it's a health tonic and it's a kitchen staple. I know it is in my, in my kitchen for sure, uh, vinegar. But I didn't realize the world behind it. How did you get into vinegar, um, especially making your own? And then, okay, let's start. I have so many questions. Let's start from the beginning. Where did this, when did this happen? When did the light bulb go off for you that you were like, oh man, vinegar, that's where it's at? Um, so the property we moved to has, um, I think, six really old, you know, centurion apple trees. And so they make a lot of apples. <laughs> They're huge, full-size beauties. And, you know, the first few years, it was all about um, apple rings and apple sauce and apple juice. And then we bought a cider press <laughs> and froze, froze the, the sweet cider. And somewhere in there, it was it just so much, right? And and it makes more sense to not have to keep it in a freezing situation, you know, on a, a power source. And so that was another way to preserve it. First, it becomes hard cider, which is wonderful and, you know, can be enjoyed that way. And then you can take it the next step to uh, vinegar. Like I said, where there's alcohol, the acetic bacteria, you want to make vinegar. So this is real sciencey things. Did you know? Did you know about this going into it, or was this okay? So tell me that process. Oh, none of that. Okay. Um, you basically make cider, right? Um, which is a fermentation. So imagine the cider press with pressing. You're crushing and pressing the apples, and you're making juice. Um, we all know of you know cider that we get in the fall. Um, you you leave that out. Like I said, the microbes that want to ferment it, the yeast and, and all that, are already on the fruit. They're in that juice as soon as you press it, and they're ready to go. Um, so what you're doing as a, as a cider maker first, or a vinegar maker, is you're managing the microbes. 
in all of fermentation, they're doing the work for you. You're, all your job is to do is kind of, kind of guide them and step out of the way. Right. So cider, the yeast will start consuming that sugar. I mean, you know how sweet apples are. They'll consume that sugar. They create alcohol. And that's where you get hard cider. So um, I, have, I have a beer making friend who told me a um, long time ago, the yeast eats the sugar and then poops out alcohol. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. I just love yeah. that. I just love that vision. Yes. And so now take that vision a step further. You've got in the air, you've got acetic bacteria and they're coming in on the apples too. But here's the thing, the yeast can work without oxygen. So for example, I have here, this is just some store-bought cider. Okay. Uh, just, and I put yeast in it. And you can kind of see there's a little bit of white on the top and there's if you could see it well, you'd see that the, it's bubbling in there. And that's the yeast doing exactly what your friend said, eating and pooping, <laughs> um, creating CO2 and alcohol, right? So I'm doing this, you see this on there, because right. that's letting CO2 out, but no new oxygen in. So it's happening without oxygen, because as soon as we get oxygen, we're gonna, we're gonna um, give breath to the acetic bacteria, which are our, our acid makers. Okay. And when we want to um, then turn that into vinegar, we're gonna put that in a jar or some kind of, um, like I've got a vinegar pot here that you can't really see, but, and you open it up. So now that same liquid has lots of oxygen available to it. So when that happens, the acetic bacteria take over. They can, they don't kill the uh, yeast. They're still making, if they're partway through, they'll still keep eating those sugars. Mm -hmm. But the acetic bacteria will start partying. They're drinking that alcohol and pooping out, or however you want to say it, acid. I like pooping. That's a good word. So, okay, so let me get this straight. So you're, you're, you're taking the hard cider and then it's actually going going backwards kind of to make the vinegar well it's losing the alcohol content right it's going further forward into acid like a natural okay. process of fermentation would be sugar alcohol acid and believe it or not now this is the crazy part really nerdy here but acetic bacteria are capable of eating acid also. So once they run out of alcohol, they don't want to die, right? So yeah. they're like, okay, what else is here? Oh, there's all this acid. They'll keep eating. If they have oxygen, they'll keep eating and turn the whole thing back into water, which is kind of where it started out in the apple, right? <laughs> That's crazy. Wait. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, no, mind blowing. So what do you have to do to stop it from eating eating the acid? It's a, really simple. You put just a lid on it? Oxygen. But say that again. You have a lid on it again. You, you um, take out the oxygen. Yeah. So like that's why we buy vinegar in containers that are airtight. So I don't know if you heard me. That's what I said. I said put a lid on it. Look at me. You yeah, you're right. Put a lid on it. I can make vinegar. Done. You're, you're done. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> it actually is that easy. I mean, technically, it the juice wants to become vinegar. Now, it's a little more nuanced, this, but technically, you could put apple juice in here, put a little, you know, cover of some kind. I like to use coffee filters and let it go. But you might have other bacteria. So just... Okay, so quick question then. I mean, I've looked into making like my own sauerkraut, for instance, but mm -hmm. the idea of even kombucha, I got into that for a little bit. Even the idea of something sitting out on my counter, just sort of sitting there working and doing things, like there's, there's a part of me, and I'm all about it, but there's a part of me that I'm just like, gross. That's just gross. But it's sure. not. It's not. 
Well, here's the thing. It's not you, it's, it's our society in general since about germ theory. And we've grown up with germ theory that says, you know, everything has to be sterile. Um, it has to be put in the refrigerator. Like you can't leave anything out, right? That's how we grew up. Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of understanding that German theory has its place and it's for sure very, very important to all kinds of health safety, right? But um, it kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater in that we didn't realize when you know, humans didn't realize yet that we are actually, you know, 90% bacteria also, and that we actually um, co-evolved with these foods that are alive and we need it. And so it's just kind of retraining some of that thinking that was drummed into all of us as little, as little people and, and yeah. even as adults, you know, put, um, put it in the fridge. And acid is really interesting because acid is the superpower. And so for that sauerkraut you mentioned, mm -hmm. what happens, right? It's getting sour. And it's that sourness that makes it safe from all the bugaboos, like E. coli and um, the pathogens, um, botulism, all those can't grow, can't live, can't survive in that nice acidic environment. That's why vinegar has been used as a preservative you know, for thousands of years. That is amazing. And that's why it's so good for our guts too. Mm-hmm. So all of it, acid and those enzymes that come in with those foods start in your digestive system, helping you, you know, as soon as it hits the stomach. Sure. So I, I get that you had all of these apples and you were doing cider and then did you stumble upon the vinegar making or did you actually do, do some research to go, I, I kind of want to make some vinegar out of this because like you said, you didn't have to freeze it, right? It could just sit in a pantry somewhere. Sure. Yeah. No, I did some research and um, this was before like anything was really out there on the internet. <laughs> and so it was really more old books and trial by error or fire or whatever. How yeah. I say that? You went, old, <laughs> you went old school. You actually cracked open a book. <laughs> back, back, back in the day. <laughs> yeah. I just, we don't, I mean, seriously we don't do that anymore you know like i mean I, I can't tell you the last time i've been in a library which is super sad i know isn't that crazy yeah. well and then with the pandemic i i was traveling the country teaching you know because live teaching people are now interested in it when i was doing this at first nobody was interested and then suddenly it's like cool and so oh um, with vinegar's hot I, yeah vinegar's hot <laughs> it is. It's 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 a little trendy right now. It's super hot. We're gonna talk about that. Um, but I want to get back to the benefits of vinegar because I think it sounds like to me once you started doing your research on this and you were making more vinegars, you were you obviously got hooked. I mean, you've written books on it. So, what were you finding that was so helpful about vinegar? Um, well, the ferments in general, I would say, would be. Um, I feel like uh, a diet rich in all kinds of fermented foods is, is super helpful. Um, vinegar just being one of them. Vinegar is interesting because vinegar has incredible, I don't want to sound too sciencey again, but it's got, it's got a lot of micronutrients in it that have been processed by the bacteria. But as far as live bacteria, yeah, even though there's live vinegar bacteria in this, um, is this a pretty color? This was actually made with sweet potatoes. Wow. Um, the purple. Um, even though this has live vinegar bacteria in it, those aren't one of our gut microbes, but it's also got enzymes. It's got um, phenolics. It's got all kinds of things that we do need. Um, and then using vinegar as, you know, on, on skin can help balance the pH. And, and so it's got all these other benefits. If you're talking about fermented foods for the live culture, you know, and the probiotics, then you want to look towards things like um, the sauerkraut, miso, um, you know, and, and so many of these other foods. Right, for sure. And I was going to ask you, you brought up the sweet potato vinegar. It's not all apples, right? You can, you can turn a lot of different things into vinegar. 
Sure, yeah, I, the examples I brought you today are the sweet potato. This um, is tomato. Whoa. Tastes, tastes like tomatoes out of the garden. And you'll notice on this one too, it's, it's thicker. You can strain all that out and make a clear vinegar, but kind of why, right? You're gonna get the fiber and in a salad, it's gonna make a creamier dressing. Um, this is a really nice vinegar. It's a uh, persimmon vinegar. And again, this one, I've gone ahead and left, you know, some of those solids in there, but it gives it incredible flavor. You can start doing things with these vinegars that you wouldn't, wouldn't dream of. I also do vinegar drinks. Um, so water or bubbly water, and then you, you know, splash a little of this persimmon vinegar in there. You still get the sweetness of the persimmon and you get just a, a wonderful, um, really refreshing drink. Yeah, I got uh, this hip to, um, is, are they shrubs? Is that what they're called? Huh? Shrubs, yeah. Shrub? I, got, I got hip to those a few years ago. There's a local chef here who is all about them. Um, just making all these different drinks with vinegars and maybe even simple syrup and, and bubbling water. And they were incredible, delicious. Mm -hmm. They're super delicious. They're a wonderful way if you, you know, are a soda drinker or like, you know, that type of thing. They're a wonderful way to take something that's absolutely not healthy and throw some benefits back into it. <laughs> no kidding. I mean, sorry, all you soda drinkers out there. I just can't do it. And I just don't, I mean, I, we're not going to get into that. Um, that's a little controversial talking about soda, but um, I was going to ask you, I've read that it's good to take a little shot of apple cider vinegar in the morning. And then I've read the exact opposite that like, don't do that. That's awful for you. I'm going to ask you because you're the expert. <laughs> Less of a health expert than a making expert. But um, so that's one of those things where like most things, there is not a one size fits all. For most people with, um, you know, a fairly healthy digestive system or even one that they're trying to get more healthy, but isn't like completely one way or the other, it is very helpful because what it does is most folks in modern society have low stomach acid. The acid mm -hmm. is too to digest their food. So what that does is that little shot kind of gives your stomach acid a little boost and it's gonna help you digest all your other foods. And that's the other beauty of adding, you know, these vinegars or even sauerkraut or some of these sour acidic ferments to your diet with your meal is not only does it have the benefit of itself, but it helps you digest and get more availability and, and nutrient out of all your food. Plus it tastes great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for so, sure. But if you're a, if you're somebody who, you know, has acid reflux or has acid issues anyway, that's like putting fuel on your fire, right? So although, you know, it it's so individual because there it can also work to neutralize some of that acid that's mm -hmm. causing you problems. So it's really something that every individual has to discover for themselves and also you know maybe talk to the healthcare practitioner if they're really having trouble yeah for sure um that's why i drink a lot of margaritas uh because <laughs> right it's health food <laughs> my husband my husband and i joke that we're never going to get scurvy because we drink so many margaritas so i'm good there you go i'm good you're good no you got that one check <laughs> yeah, right, right. Okay, in all seriousness, it's super easy to brew your own vinegar at home, right? You were just saying you could get a jar of apple juice and within a matter of what? What's the time the time length here? You're going to have vinegar. Um, so it ta you know, it depends on um how you know, literally just opening up apple juice it's gonna take months and you may or may not get the right microbes to really work for okay. you. But if you're like actively, like you're gonna get some yeast in there to get the alcohol started, put a little um, raw vinegar, you know, like just purchased raw unpasteurized vinegar in there to get it started. You're looking at a month or two. Another really cool thing that I'm, I just brought another show and tell item because I think this is cool. I love so show and tell. 
<laughs> so you can get little, um, I've got a ceramic version too. And so what this is, is this is, if you drink wine or if you're even a beer drinker, beer vinegar is excellent. Um, very easy to make beer vinegar. It's got kind of a maltiness or an IPA vinegar has got a nice bitterness with it. Oh. Um, when I was doing recipes for the book, just for kicks, you know, because I had some college kids, I made PD, uh, is it PDR, PDR vinegar. No way. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And it's, it's fun. You can, anything that has sugar or alcohol can become vinegar. Okay. So say, you know, Rogue Valley, we've got a lot of vineyards and you have those bottles of wine and you don't quite finish the last little bit or whatever. You can do something like this. It's a continuous brew. And um, let's see if I can show you. So I can just uh, maybe. I can just get vinegar out of this huh. and use that as needed. And what I do is I've got a, a mother in here. This is all cultured. It's ready to go. If we have a bottle of wine or whatever and it's not finished, I just pour that in and it's constantly churning out new vinegar and processing that. So it's kind of a zero waste tip where you now are, you know, making your own wine vinegar at home. Yeah. So there's lots of, that way, once you have one of those, you're always in vinegar. You don't even have to wait. Sort of long answer to how long. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. I, I rarely have leftover wine, but I mean, I, I'll save a little splash to, to create my own red wine vinegar. That, that's what that is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or if you're a beer drinker, you could do that with beer. You can right. have your own beer pot or um, like this pot here is red wine vinegar, but I have another one that's both cider and wine and whatever. And it's more the uh, house vinegar and you never know what it's going to taste like. <laughs> so besides, besides the red wine that's in there, what else did you put in there? To, was it yeast? Well, to get it started, I simply put in a um, bottle of wine. Okay. Um, a wine is higher in alcohol level, so the vinegar likes right around six to ten percent ABV, and wine's a little higher. So I put in a cup of water, and I put in a let's see, was it a half cup? I think a half cup of raw vinegar, like just so if somebody wanted to get one of these started, that's it. Start with a bottle of wine, cup of water. And then the other thing is one more little trick with wine is if it has sulfites, right? Because winemakers are kind of not into their wine turning into vinegar. If it has sulfites, which are preservatives, that the vinegar bacteria don't thrive in that. So you put in, believe it or not, a, a half a teaspoon of 3% um, food grade hydrogen peroxide gets rid of the sulfites, leaves no flavor problems, and you're good to go. Crazy. I know. I love it. It's easy. It's easy. I can see now why you've, you've sort of nerded out on this over the last several years, because it's just, I can see, I mean, for you, was it like, huh, I could make vinegar out of this. I wonder if I can do it out of this and this and this. Is that how it went? Totally. That's how you, that's, you know, you start with just like apple, but as soon as you get what's going on in the process, then it's like, especially with vinegar versus some of the other ferments, it's like game, game's on. Okay. Um, so. Uh, when did you yeah. write your first book? Uh, 2014, the first one came out. Okay. Your latest book, Home Brewed Vinegar, how did this come about? Were you really wanting to put your knowledge in the hands of people at home to make their, their own vinegar? I mean, this one's actually a funny story. So the book that came out um, last fall is a cider book. And it's a gorgeous book. And all I, I wish you could see it because it's like all the Applegate Valley. I mean, it's just... Aww beautiful yes but um the i was in charge of the vinegar chapter in that book and um 
because I was having so much fun with it. it it's, uh, but it was only apple vinegars and um, it's a cider book, right? <laughs> it was like, if you're not a writer, it probably doesn't mean anything to you, but it was a 15,000 word chapter. The whole book was about 80,000 words. So it was a little weighted. And um, the uh, editor wrote back and, and she said, we need to talk about vinegar. And so what happened was the vinegar chapter was kicked out of the cider book and became its own book. How dare actually, they? But no, that's no. good. That's good though. It was because now see all these different colors on here, I got to play. And that was exactly what you said. It was like, once I started to really play, it was like, oh, I wonder if I have made, I've made vinegar from all the little, you know, um, woody ends of asparagus. I've made vinegar from shallots, you know, now it's ready to be a, a shallot vinaigrette. So you can just, you can have a lot of fun. Man. All right. I got to pick this book up. That sounds amazing. I also am curious how many little jars you have around your house and big jars. Oh my. <laughs> so, um, I don't know if you can kind of see back in that corner there, there's some jars. Yeah. Um, but actually, uh, and then there's my regular kitchen there's some jars, but so back when we were in the height of a family and all of that. I really wanted a root cellar. I was going old school on everything at that time. <laughs> kind of laugh at myself now. Um, so we put in a uh, what we call our fermentation caves, and um, they are literally uh, built into the hillside rooms that keep a constant temperature. And yeah. so um, I would say probably. Hundreds of hundreds stars of things. Yeah. Can I can I come out and see your caves sometime? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, but do you, are you the kind that like maybe you're somewhere shopping around and you see this jar and you're like, oh, I gotta have that. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta take it. And then if I love it, I have to play with how can I repeat it or make something like it or riff on it. So yeah, yeah that's, that's how I entertain myself. Now that the kids are all on and you know, the garden's tiny, <laughs> it's more, my kids come home and they see the fridge and they're like, cause it's all jars of things, you know, no labels. They're like, mom, let's talk. <laughs> you have a condiment problem. <laughs> mom, you have a problem. You have a problem. I love that. Um, you also were featured in a Vogue article. How cool. Yeah, I was pretty excited about that. So how did that happen? Did someone give you a call? Like, how, how did that come about? Yeah, I, one of those days where you open your email in the morning and there's a request and you go, ah! <laughs> um, Kirsten, I'm still waiting on that. I'm still waiting on Vogue <laughs> to send me an email. How cool. Well, I, was, I, I know, I was laughing when it came out or even when I, when it was, you know, starting to happen. Cause I was like, wow. And when I was a teenager, you know, that was the dream, you know, but of course it would be like me and a picture of me and some cool outfit. <laughs> Instead it's my name and it's about a sour liquid. <laughs> I mean, but, Hey, who cares? Uh, I was pretty excited. Yeah. I bet. I bet. Um, total hair flip moment for you. Right. I mean, you're just like, yeah, I'm featured in a, in a Vogue, in, in Vogue magazine. Um, the name of the article is called Acid Trip, <laughs> how small batch vinegars became a kitchen phenomenon. And even in this, they say, the author says, you can't ignore that vinegar is having a moment. And it is. It is. And that's, you know, kind of the funny thing because I've been doing this. It was a book that was, you know, the book came from being kicked out of another book. <laughs> And so there was no, like, I had no clue vinegar was having a moment. It was just something I was doing. So now I'm, I'm kind of hoping, you know, it's, it's coming out what, in May, May 11th. And so I'm hoping, okay, let's, let's ride the moment. <laughs> yeah. The, the book is coming out May 11th, right? Yes. Okay. Where can people find it? 
You know, it's available for pre-order at any place you buy books. I always encourage people to go to their local booksellers. Um, otherwise, um, online sources, bookshop.org, any of the, the online places you buy books. And um, if you want signed copies, we're also taking pre-orders. So that's just at ferment.works. Awesome. Is my, um, website. And I also just launched a vinegar class. It's also pre orders, but been filming it right here in the space and it's at fermentationschool.com. So if you're not a book person, but you're a uh, watch, watch and do along person, that's yeah. another option. And people can also go to uh, the website. Is it ferment works? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it's ferment dot work. Yes. Those funny, not comms. <laughs> gotcha. Um, and this, this interview will actually air probably late May, um, early June. So I will be curious to see how book sales are going around that time. But um, yeah, I agree. Go visit your local bookshop if, if you have one to see if you can find this. But um, how cool. I mean, this is so amazing that I always feel like the universe gives us signs and, and a path maybe. And this book started because you got kicked out of another book. I think that's so great. <laughs> yeah and um it's been for me one of i mean i've had fun with all the books but in a way it's been one of the most fun in that um because anything can come vinegar it's like you said you know you just start looking at the world differently oh i bet i'm sure you do and my husband all his cider and his you know his fermentation products like no don't, don't look at those <laughs> So your husband makes cider? He does. He's the main cider maker. Man. So he's making cider. You're making vinegar. You guys probably have the healthiest guts on the planet. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> I love it. All right. Uh, on that. A little longevity here. <laughs> yep, for sure. Um, all right, Kirsten, we're going to wrap up just a little bit and get to uh, the final three. But again, Home Brewed Vinegar, uh, by the time this interview comes out, the book is out, um, and it's just a guide to make your own vinegars right on your uh, kitchen counters, right? Yes, absolutely, with, with zero equipment, stuff you already have in your house. Okay, I gotta, I gotta learn more about this. I'm, I'm grabbing the book because I need to make some shallot vinegar, I think. Um, all right, let's get to the final three. Uh, best advice you've ever been given? Um, you know, that was the one that's, that's the one that always stumps me. Um, still just, uh, to pivot, you know, and not get stuck in your ways a long time ago. Um, yeah. You know, that's huge. It, it, yeah. It was my grandma that was like, and she was the grandma that wasn't, um, bitter about anything. Interesting. So. So that, that came from grandma to pivot? To pivot. I think she used a different word. I think that's the word I use now, but it was, it was just roll, roll with it. You know, just don't get, don't get stuck in anything. Mm -hmm. And I, and it, it's been true. I mean, look at this past year with COVID. You have to, right? You have to roll with it. You have to evolve a little bit. You have to pivot. Otherwise, um, you just get stuck. I actually, I just brought this up recently. I interviewed a guy who, a uh, former uh, psychologist, and he was saying during a crisis, there's four different kinds of people and we need to be the navigators, right? So we, we have to keep moving and navigating through a crisis. We can't stay the victim. We can't stay the bystander. We have to keep on moving. And that part of that interview has always stuck with me because it's like, yeah, you got to navigate. You got to keep rolling with it. You got to keep pivoting. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. Good. Well, good advice. <laughs> and that, right? When we are grinding along with something that isn't working, it doesn't feel okay. And as soon as we can, you know, then, yeah. then it move forward. So I like that. I like navigation. It seems nice way to look at it too. Yeah, 100%. Uh, what's your happy place? Um, the Applegate Valley. That's an easy one. <laughs> you know, there's a, you probably keep seeing it. There's a, there's a 
yellow jack. I mean, a wasp that's gotten in here. <laughs> oh. Um, he just keeps going past me. It but, likes all um, the vinegar. Yeah, that's probably it. Um, definitely hiking up in the mountains, uh, in the big trees, and just, yeah, being out there. And uh, having a glass of Applegate Valley wine, of course, because it's some of the best. Of course. Of course. Why not? <laughs> okay, in all things food and drink, what do you crave? Okay, now this one is... Um, most people don't know what this is, but with uh, all this fermentation writing I've been doing, one of the books was about fermented beans and grains. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it became natto, which is a sort of yucky, slimy Japanese ferment. It's not yucky. That's the wrong word. It's viscous. And so for American palates especially, it's not a texture we're used to. It's texturally... Um, challenging but it proved to me a couple of things and one is that your microbiome and your cravings do not come from uh, your mind they come from your gut mm. and I didn't love natto at all I, but as I was developing recipes around it I had to keep eating it and then suddenly I was craving it and interesting so, something I really do crave and I do all kinds of things with it but it's soup it's the highest thing in vitamin k and um so it's super healthy uh is the texture anything close to like okra yes yeah very much like okra and so that's the challenge I try to tell people if you can you know all cultures like in Asia, they don't love cheese and they don't love stringy cheese, but we do in this country. So if you kind of just like in your mind pivot to, you know, we have stringy things too. They're not maybe as pizza isn't as slimy, but it's still, you know, yeah. something um, may not, depending on where you grew up, right? May not be interesting to your, you just have to retrain yourself. But oh, for sure. I, yeah. But now that I, I crave it. It's weird because it's coming from this, like this other place. <laughs> uh, hey, again, pivot, right? You got to uh, pivoting there. Um, anything in the drink world? In the drink world? Um, I would have to say I'm a cider, I'm a cider girl. Yeah. With, with red wine mixed in. Oh, interesting. Wait, hold the phone. Not no, not together. Just okay. someday. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? I haven't heard of this drink before. Uh, and some good, go ahead. Yeah, and I love the sour ciders and the, the sour beers that are coming out, mm -hmm. you know, where the fermentation is getting more funky. And the natural wines also, you're getting a little more, um, I kind of love what's happening. You know, we went from standardizing everything around our food to um, now the trend is, is finding your unique spot. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's interesting. And well, there's so much coming out too, whether it's vinegar or, you know, the sour beers and ciders and even winemaking. It's all, it's all pretty cool right now what's happening. People are getting um, real nerdy out there and I love it. Yeah. And, and it's great because a lot of it's bringing it into local food systems and you're really starting to taste your place again, um, which I think we've lost for a while. I, I, mean, I agree. We, we have still but you know it's there now <laughs> i agree i like it all right well kirsten chalky you've been absolutely uh, fascinating uh mind-blowing conversation about vinegar and again you are the author of home brewed vinegar uh, which is out uh, so people can pick that up wherever you like to buy books so uh, thank you so much for joining me absolutely thanks for having me on and it was great to meet you and uh if anyone's listening you can subscribe rate and review wherever you like to listen to podcasts and helps other people find us if you're watching this you can do so at ktdl.com and on youtube just look for off script with trish close one more time kirsten shockey thank you so much it's nice to uh, again like you said nice to meet you virtually